Today we read chapters nine and 10 for anybody following along with us in the book. And um, we got a little bit more mythology. I think it's kind of interesting that the books have gotten less mythology heavy as we've gone. And I do think that Rick gives enough background on the mythology just like as a preface before I get too into it, like it, the stories today, there's there's enough background. There's a few that he leaves mysteries in these books because he wants the big reveal at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's kind of hints if you do know some of the mythology with the things that he writes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. So where we left off was that Percy and um, Blackjack, which is his basically his Pegasus, um, they leave camp and they are following the bus that it turns out Zoe Nightshade is the one driving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think it's also funny that like as he's following in the beginning of this chapter, he's remarking at how fast she is flying through because he's trying to keep up on Blackjack, which is like an animal, and like trying to make sure his animal doesn't get too exhausted. Yeah, and also like trying to make sure Blackjack is okay while also like it's a whole thing with him of like being in the sky is always like a bit of a risk because of Zeus always hating him. Yeah. And so that's risky and it's also like, but I can't be, I can't get too low because the normal people will see me and who knows what they'll think they'll be seeing, but they'll be seeing something. <laughs> and they also, I don't want them to see me. Yeah, <laughs> so. The thing that he's doing there for, and he's like, just, where, I, I personally like just him just being like, where are they going? <laughs> <laughs> like they're, they're driving through, he's saying the traffic was bad in the city because it's around the holidays. This is during the winter. But on the plus side, at least the clouds are lower because it is so cold out. And so for them to stay hidden, they're up in the air, but it's super chilly and he didn't even pack for this adventure. No, I don't even think he has a jacket on. He mentions a coat at one point because we'll get to that later, but oh, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he has a proper jacket for New York. Like as a non East coaster, I feel like they usually make big differences of like a winter coat versus, you know, yeah. like just a, a hoodie. Here in California, you could get away with a hoodie in our winters. You probably can in New York. No, it would be way too cold. Like you can, people in Wisconsin, it's like a, a joke or whatever about people who live here that it'll be like 20 degrees out sometimes and people will be walking around in like hoodies and like basketball shorts. <laughs> um, but most people aren't, you know, from here and even, we get like that when the winter gets too so far that 20 degrees seems warm after it's been like below zero for a while and yeah. so christmas time in new york would be way too cold especially high up like that yeah so um they are still following the bus when i think so the beginning of the chapter is when he realizes zoe is driving and blackjack is just when they stop on top of the Chrysler building, he's like, hey, can we find a donut shop? Look, there's one over there. Can we get donuts? <laughs> Which I thought was like a funny callback because I mean, the, we had monster donuts at Sea of Monsters. It's not like every donut shop is a monster shop. But part of me was like, what if that was? Like, what if that was a branch of monster donuts? <laughs> Blackjack loves his donuts. That's yeah. the thing. If you reading this, I was like, I wonder if Percy ever had any pets because he seems like he would be a great pet owner because yes. he's actually thinking about like, oh, I don't want my horse to get really tired and I feel really bad that it's like trying to act like it's not as tired and exhausted as it actually is because it's trying to do what I what like it's trying to help me out. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, like in a little apartment, they might not have been allowed to have a lot probably. Yeah, and like, let's be honest here, like, Dave would never let him have something that would actually make him happy. And just from experience of having abusive people like that, they don't like, they don't, they don't like pets very much. Um, my dad got rid of so many cats growing up that my sister and I genuinely don't know how many cats we have. Oh my gosh, yeah. Got rid of so many of them. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a few stories from you before. I didn't realize there was countless. Yeah, like we honestly don't know like they would get like we see pictures and we don't even know what cats those are <laughs> yeah 
Um, but yeah, he would be because he really is. He's like, he's worried about blackjack. He's like, he feels bad that they never end up getting donuts because to to get him off the donuts that they see in that moment, he's like, we'll get donuts when we get to New Jersey, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and it never happens. And he even remarks on, I, I kind of feel bad. I broke that promise. Yeah. Yeah, because he, well, I like that bitch because he just assumes because of how his quest was, the mm -hmm. first one that he went on anyway, um, that like they would be going to New York or some or New Jersey or something to find like some other train or bus or whatever to take. I, like it, it takes a long time to drive to Washington. Like that's like many, like I, I've been to like the Washington DC area like many years ago and it takes a couple hours to get from New York all the way down there. And so it would actually be a long drive of him just being like, where are you guys going? <laughs> like, why are you driving the camp's van all the way here? <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know that yet, though. He's he's just yeah. like, they, they seem to be going a weird way and they're going super fast. And how is Zoe even allowed to drive? Because she looks like 12. What yeah. does the driver's license say? Um, <laughs> but they are caught midair by Dionysus. So as they're going off of the Chrysler building after this little pause, um, Percy has grapevines crawling up his leg. And yeah, so Mr. D comes out and, you know, um, Blackjack's freaking out. He's like, oh shit, there's a god here. And, um, you know, he's he's doing the, like, why are you away from camp? You didn't think I'd, I'd notice you. Um, but Percy kind of, the way he plays it off, it's very much like, okay, I'm still going, like, yeah. what do you want me to say? Um, and he, he even gets mad at him at one point. Yeah, he's like, I'm already here, so, and like, yes, I did think that you wouldn't care because you don't care about anything else, so why would you care about me leaving? Yeah. Let's see, so one of the things that I highlighted was that moment where he balls his fist, which is, um, right after Dionysus says, I should throw you off this building minus the flying horse and see how heroic you sound on the way out. Um, and Percy already has, like, he knows Mr. D hates him. Um, he has that in his head. Plus, he's had the conflict with Ares already. He's, he's basically never had a wholly positive interaction with a god at this point, it seems like. No. Yeah. So that immediately bawling his fist to me stuck out as like, he really is not okay here. No. Well, and this is why I like this book, even though it's difficult, is that like, why, why should, why would he, <laughs> like, yeah. why would he be okay right now? Like we get, we get like the added thing that we hear or can read his like internal dialogue that he doesn't share with most people on the outside added thing that we hear or can read his like why would he <laughs> like yeah. why would he be okay right now like we get we get like the added thing that we hear or can read his like internal dialogue that he doesn't share with most people on the outside yeah. but like when you're reading this book you know that he nothing is going right everything is going wrong everyone is blaming him somehow for oh, something God. that is going on that is not his fault um and it's just like what else i don't know what how he's supposed to handle all of this stuff like he just had to like promise a 10 year old kid that his sister will get killed after she joined the hunters and the hunters won't talk to him and he's having nightmares about annabeth and they won't talk to him so he can tell them that he found their scary creature and he can't even tell them that either. <laughs> and it's just the last time he saw Dionysus was him saying that he thinks that Annabeth is dead anyway. So why bother trying to rescue her? Yeah, and, exactly. and it's like what? <laughs> right after everything else that happened, like he and especially with the all the Thalia stuff, like Thalia blames him for Annabeth and he blames himself for it. And so it's like, how many times can, can like abusive ass pieces of shit who are men, like threaten to hurt him when he's not doing anything wrong before he finally just like punches one of them in the face? Like he should be allowed to do that for Dionysus. Like Dionysus, you're threatening to throw a kid 
off of a building because you think it'd be funny to listen to them die. Yeah. I that, have a lot to say about what Dionysus says to him, honestly. That's where you're, that's, that's like, you're like, you're standing here in this and like, there's so much to say about this Dionysus part because he could not be more of a fucking hypocrite. <laughs> and like, exactly. and like, honestly, this part is like the, the whole like, triggering thing about abusive people like it's not surprising to me that percy is like can i punch this god in the face during this part because he not only because he deserves it but like it's just the the backwards like there's no logic and they just say this stuff to your face like as if you it's fine <laughs> you're just like you don't make any sense am i not supposed to mention that <laughs> Yeah, and so Percy, it, he restrains himself physically, but he does say, why do you hate me so much? What did I do to you? Like, why me specifically? And Dionysus's answer is a mythological answer. It is, did I ever tell you about my wife, Ariadne? And um, so I think all of the relevant mythology is here in that um, she was a maiden helper of Theseus who fought the Minotaur, and she betrayed her own father by... Um, I think she also armed him, but she also gave him the thread that helped him navigate the labyrinth. Um, and let's see, I made some notes here because I didn't want to miss anything. Um, let's see. So when he says, um, let's see, Theseus said he would marry her. He took her aboard his ship, sailed for Athens, halfway back on an island called Naxos. He, what's the word you mortals use today? He dumped her. So um, he didn't just uh, dump, uh, dump her. In some versions, it's abandoned as they slept. In other versions, she was already pregnant with twins. Um, and let's see here. One version, he actually had left her there because he had a nightmare about Dionysus saying, you better leave the girl behind. So, you know, and it, the the additions that make it a worse offense happen later and later. Like, I know I talk shit on Theoi, but if you look up the page on Ariadne, um, they'll, they'll put the snippets of all of the relevant lines of text from mythology on there. And as they get like later and later, cause they're in chronological order, you see more added to the story to make it sound worse and worse almost for her um, until she's eventually made his wife. And so like, yeah, Ariad Ariadne has a very rough story. And um, Mr. D brings up like you heroes are all the same. You do this to girls because maiden helpers are a, they're a continual theme. It's kind of like an archetype of what a girl can be. And frequently it's betraying her own people in favor of a hero, but sometimes, and even in one of the examples he gives Medea, the, the maiden helper did all of that because she was under a spell from Aphrodite or sometimes Cupid slash Eros. Um, mm -hmm. Like, so it's not even of their own volition. No, and it's also just a thing of like, it doesn't make sense at all for him to be taking that out on Percy specifically mm -hmm. because he is not like that and so that's like the part that is so frustrating with him like Dionysus has never even given Percy like two seconds of like respect in any way at all like at all ever like in the tv show version he lies to him about being his dad so that he can get alcohol from him which doesn't work but like that doesn't happen in the first book but still from the very start, he has never once said his actual name. Yeah. Like, he always says his name differently. And he's always mad at him about something that has nothing to do with him. It has exactly. nothing to do with him. But he's somehow, once again, the one that is, like, like, just taking everything for people who lived thousands of years before he was ever born. And yeah. especially in this situation, like, you, you were mad at him in the lightning thief because he didn't want to go on a quest like that should go immediately against your whole thing of all heroes are bad and all heroes are like this and it's like well here's this kid who doesn't want to go on a quest and is basically telling you to go fuck yourself when he's trying to get him to go and you have to manipulate him in order to get him to leave 
<laughs> because he doesn't want to go because he doesn't want to be like a little hero like everybody else and then in the second book and now in this book he's trying to help the people he cares about he's trying to do the right thing and now you're mad at him about that and you want to throw him off of a, a skyscraper because he wants to try to save one of his best friends to find out if they're actually dead or not and so it's like what are you actually mad at him about because you're mad at him when he doesn't want to go on a quest and he doesn't want to be a hero and now you're mad at him because he wants to take care of the people which according to your fun little story would be what you would want people to do yeah and so why are you mad at him and like the the best part of this whole story which is just like where i was like oh my god i can't handle when uh like abusive sort of people do stuff like this is when Percy is like, didn't you get in trouble and like can't drink alcohol because you cheated on your wife? Like you were, you got caught with like a, a nymph of like, a, I can't remember if it was like a w water one or like a wood, one, whichever like part of nature that 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 yeah. was a part of. But he's like, isn't that why you can't drink alcohol? And he's just like completely like goes past it. And it's like, hold on can we go back to how you're a raging hypocrite <laughs> that like exactly. you're holding this like 14 year old kid to a higher standard than you hold yourself to you're a, you're a fucking god <laughs> and, and you're sitting here like threatening to kick him off of a, a giant building because you're mad that he wants to go save his friend and you're trying to act like, oh, all heroes are bad when you cheated on your wife. You cheated on your wife. How yeah. much do you actually like your wife? How much do you actually care about how much she is hurt and harmed and stuff? If you cheated on her, I'm pretty sure that hurt just as much as her being abandoned on an island somewhere. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I don't know that, like, I don't know why monogamy wasn't expected of, like, even a relationship like this, where he's like, this poor girl who I saved, who was crying and alone on an island, abandoned, everything wrong happened to her. She is my little, you know, like, angel, and I'm going to take care of her, and then I'm going to sleep with a bunch of nymphs. Like, what? <laughs> what is that? Um, and then he says something, I highlighted this because... I thought it was super hypocritical. The exact quote is, you should look at yourselves. You take what you want, you use what you have to, and then you betray everyone around you. He says that's what heroes do, but that's the Olympians do that. That's yeah. what you do. This is like, oh, this is such like a, like a, anyone, like a scapegoated person, anyone who's dealing with an abusive person deals with stuff like this, where they, I don't know, and I don't know that I'll ever know this because I don't think an abusive person would ever have the balls to like admit this to somebody like me, especially. But I'm like, I'm pretty sure that you guys are just that self unaware, like yeah. to that extreme level that you don't understand that you're project, you, you do these things, like you do these things. <laughs> and so you're accusing other people of doing or like assuming that other people have the same motivations as you because that's what you do other people are better people than you are get that yeah. through your head other people are not like morally and like just ethically like bankrupt <laughs> like you are other people actually hold values and keep with them but because they don't they just assume that everyone else feels like that because they i don't know they just have to find a reason for them not to be the bad thing and they're like oh everyone just feels like this they just lie and act like they're nicer than they are and it's like i'm pretty sure that dionysus thinks that percy is lying about how he's doing all of this to go and save annabeth he probably thinks that he's just saying that and he secretly just wants all of the attention and it's like no he's literally just doing this to save annabeth i'm pretty sure if he was doing this to like get attention he would have left with anything but the than the stuff that he has which is nothing he might have yeah. like brought some food with him even <laughs> if he was leaving because he only wanted like you know to be known and for everyone to think that he's a cool person that's yeah. not at all what's happening here and it's i just always imagine like one day like poseidon finding out about this and being like you threatened to kick my son off of a cliff because you were mad that you got caught because you cheated on your wife? Like, is is that what's going on here? 
Yeah, because like he, we go directly from Percy calling him out to that like hypocritical statement. But I want to highlight the like thing that he says at the end because it comes up in the second chapter we read for today, which is, um, you'll excuse me if I, I have no love for heroes. They are selfish, ungrateful lot. Ask Ariadne or Medea or for that matter, Zoe Nightshade. Um, so we'll get back to that, but I want to highlight that he said that because it comes back into play and it yes. comes back into play very fast. Yeah, um, but even after this weird thing, he lets him go too, which is like, what was the point of this interaction at all? Just so he could feel good about yelling at a kid. Like it's this this interaction, especially I always feel like it needs to almost be pointed out. Like this is the person who is supposed to be protecting them while they're at camp. Mm -hmm. Like this is the God that they have at camp that is supposed to help them. And he literally just showed up here to terrorize and traumatize this kid just for fun because it made him feel good. Yeah. That, because he was like, oh, this kid thinks I wouldn't, I wouldn't notice if he left. Well, I'm going to show him. And it's like, you're the one that's supposed to be helping everybody. No wonder why, like, Chiron is, like, always anxious because you do literally nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, and the thing that makes Dionysus, like, just stop and, you know, like, move on is... Um, what do you mean, asked Zoe. And he doesn't want to go into the story, so he's like, just go follow your friends, bye. Um, and that is the end of the interaction. So Percy's kind of like, what? Well, no, that's not exactly the end. He's like, you know what? The prophecy did say someone's going to die, so I'm just going to hope it's you, so bye. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and let's see, so then uh percy and blackjack take off again um but that's when they notice that they're kind of going the wrong direction and um let's see i didn't highlight too much from this but um percy stops when they stop puts on the cap and he sees them going into a convenience store it's then that he hears that the plan is for them to go through dc because grover is tracking the scent yeah, um, let's see. Is there anything else from here? Um, I thought it was funny to hear like, just like the little tidbits of yeah. Zoe not believing that Grover can actually do anything at all. Mm -hmm. And Thalia already arguing with everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's just, what a fun quest to be on. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah. And we get, I had to look this up because Rick doesn't give us it, but Zoe in this like weird fight with Talia is like, you scullion. <laughs> just like, what the hell is a scullion? <laughs> it turns out it's the name for like a low level slave. <laughs> I, I just like that, uh, that Thalia like 25% of the time so far when she's talking to Zoe is just like, can you learn like modern slang? Can you just learn any word at all that anyone has said since like 1935? <laughs> She's saying be and die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, let's see. So we have some of the back and forth between Percy and Blackjack after that, where he's starting to realize Blackjack's never going to tell me if he's too exhausted. So I need to take control here. And um, so is that where we get to when he notices they're being followed? I think it is. Um, so he notices that they're being followed and he notices that it's Dr. Thorne from the beginning of the book meeting a manticore. Mm -hmm. And um, especially once they finally land and they're at like the space museum and Dr. Thorne for some reason doesn't go in. He goes over to, was it the Met or? No, the Natural History Museum. Mm -hmm. And um, so he, Percy decides to follow Dr. Thorne instead of going to the Space Museum with the others. And it's a good thing he does because he gets to overhear the plan. But I thought it was interesting. The reason he follows Dr. Thorne, though, that he explains is he says if he had survived from the fall, meaning the fall in the beginning of the book out the window, then that means that Annabeth must be okay too. And that's why he takes off following him, even though he's like literally walking into his own trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he just, I like, I like that kind of thing that they have in these books where sometimes in 
books like this, like sci-fi fantasy ones, they have characters have dreams and they just like believe them. And like, that's not how people are. Like, <laughs> When you have a dream, even if you think that it could be real or something, you're just like, what the hell was that? Like, I don't know what that was. And you just kind of wonder what that, if that meant anything or anything. Like, that's why there's all those websites that are like, what does your dream mean? Where people can look up meanings if they, if they actually remember their dreams. And so I liked how in like in Sea of Monsters, when he's having those like connection things with Grover, like Grover isn't sure that he's even getting like the message until they actually show up there. Yeah. And the same way with this, that yeah, he he legitimately doesn't know if she's dead or not. Yeah. And it, I almost like wish that like just to like make the point of that, like this kid is like desperately on this quest. He has like nothing. And he's just there because he's so desperate to find out if his best friend is dead or not because he generally doesn't know if she's dead like dionysus and the rest of them are like almost like assuming in a way that she, if she's not dead that she's gonna be dead before they find her okay. and it's like yeah of course she's gonna like run after the person that took her because it's like oh he's still alive then sh maybe sh i have a chance to actually see her again and it's like he's still like a kid and he also just has actual feelings yeah. and so he's gonna run over there and and not really think about what he's doing until it's already happening yeah um i wanted to just add to my own conspiracy theory here with rick riordan so um as he's entering the natural history museum he has a little dyslexic slip up and he says I thought the sign said closed for a pirate event, but it turns out that it said closed for a private event. Both pirate and private are Latin origin. So, <laughs> I and I mean, like, that. There's, there's other words in that sentence that are of Latin origin, but just saying, he doesn't trip up on the Greek words as much. I love how he does that. And this part was fun for me, like them being at these, um, these museums because i've actually been there yeah. and the like first time i read all of these books i hadn't been there before <laughs> i went to washington dc in like 2017 to meet with some friends that i made who lived who lived there and we went to that museum and i remember at the time the thing that it made me think about was the marvel movies because uh the winter soldier movie they go to the museum of I think it's the the space and air museum mm -hmm. like in the movie they go they go and they have like a captain america exhibit or whatever and so this time i was reading it and i'm like oh i've actually been to this place <laughs> so i know exactly where they are and i somewhat remember what it looks like <laughs> like this is way more fun because i remember the first time i read these like this book five bazillion times i had never been there before and so i remember this part was hard for me to like picture in my mind what it looked like because I didn't I I didn't know what these museums actually looked like or like how close together they were or anything like that. And they are like all right next to each other. Yeah. If yeah. this podcast ever starts making money, we're doing field trips. We're, we're doing yeah. field trips to some of these yeah. things. Yeah. Um let's see. So once he's like, in you know, like no watch like we don't post anything for like a day and a half and then also we just post a like a video of us standing at the dam. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying, damn. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, Rick loved that. Um, so once they, once he actually gets inside of the Natural History Museum, that's where he sees Trakainai and Annabeth. So he was right to follow, but he also sees Luke is there, and Luke is looking really, really bad at this point. Luke's skin looks paler. Um, it looks like his scar has opened up. He seems to be really out of it. And so like, it's kind of interesting that even though he's being kind of successful in what he's trying to do, it's taking so much from him. And he's not even pausing to think like, what am I giving up here? No. And like, to the point that the, I thought that the, the important things, at least with him during this part was that he was the one that like saved their plan. Mm -hmm. that like they were that like the the general is is mad at um is mad at dr thorne because he took annabeth instead of percy 
Mm-hmm. And so he was like, what the hell am I supposed to do now? And Luke was able to like emotionally manipulate and abuse her to yeah. save their plan. But him saying that it just shows like how much, how many things he's choosing to do. And I guess that's always the thing with Luke is that it's easy to just remember his like traumatic childhood and be like, oh, it's not his fault. It's the God's fault. And it's like, actually this stuff is directly his fault. Like, even if he's being manipulated by Kronos at some point or other, like these are active decisions that he's making on his own. He has to want, he has to be the one to decide to do this stuff. He's the one who decided to do that to Annabeth and almost kill her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's almost how people will say like abusers were abused as kids. And you have to make active choices to turn into that. You have to actively say, I'm never going to heal. You know, like, I I can never say as a person who was spanked as a child that my first instinct has ever been to hit my child. You know, um, I, I do have problems with yelling still. I will 100% admit that I am not a full, perfect, gentle parent. But, um, like, it would take some active choices for me to like hit William to ignore his pain, to keep going, to think this is a normal way of punishing my child. It would take so many choices to repeat those steps. Well, yeah, and I th- I think this is the thing of why I don't like talking and I don't talk to people who argue about that Luke isn't that bad or, or Luke was redeemed at the end or any, or just discussing him like that at all. It's because this is like the reality of abusive people that people don't like to admit is that they are choosing to do this. They know what they're doing. They understand that they're hurting you. But the horrible thing about that is that whatever they want is they're willing to do that to you to get what they want. And they, they, they're not like innocent to the fact that they're doing this to you. They're not like brainwashed to the and like thinking that they're not really hurting you. They intimately understand. They know more than anybody else how much they are hurting you because they are watching you go through it. They are like literally, wa- they get off on it a lot of the time. They like watching you go through this stuff and be in a lot of pain and one in like physically or mentally or both. They enjoy it. Like Luke sat there and knew that if he just got underneath the sky, that if he acted like he was in pain for 10 seconds, that Annabeth would run over and want to help him. And then he sat and didn't care that he left her there for another week after that, where she almost died. And like, it doesn't matter that after she got out of there and she actually survived that, that he was like, oh, I don't want to kill her yet. Because it's like, you're the one who put her there in the first place. So like you want saying that, doesn't change the fact that you knew what you were doing to her. Yeah. Like she had, she had no idea what you were, what you were doing there, but you did, and you chose to do that, knowing even like this scene that we're about to talk about. Like <laughs> the part that got to me when it came to like him and Percy is that as soon as they realize that somebody else is in there, he's like, "Oh, it's Percy." Yeah, like nobody else would be there because he knows them he knows them so well that he knows that if there's somebody here that they took annabeth he knows that percy is going to come after them because he knows how much they love each other and it's like what the fuck is wrong with you that you know these kids intimately enough to know how much they love each other and all you do is try to kill them like you know how much they care about each other and you and you just do this anyway (laughs) It's like, there is something wrong with you and no amount of being angry at your daddy is going to fix that. (laughs) Exactly. So then we have doctors, Dr. Thorne, you know, explaining the group of four is, you know, next door. And um, that's when we hear the plan when it got fumbled, Luke is the one who saved it. And they're blaming the manticore, Dr. Thorne, for ruining the plan. And honestly, I kind of agree because he had one of the big three children in his grasp for an entire school year. (laughs) He had two of them. And he somehow managed to not get any children of the big three. So um, he like hit like Percy with poison. Like he couldn't, he couldn't even like get up. All you had to do is like pick him up, but you ended up taking his best friend instead because you're a freaking idiot. Well, 
actually, because Artemis was trying to groom the same girl that <laughs> that you took. And so I think he just ran away from Artemis because he was like, I don't want to deal with this shit. Well, um, I mean, at any point, they could nab Talia, too, because she is also, uh, like, she could be the prophecy kid. But they're not even, like, for some reason, that's not an option that they ever discuss. Is like, why don't we try to get her on our side? There's a lot more chance that Luke can manipulate her because they have history. But they're still going with Percy because for whatever reason, they see him as, I don't know, weaker or not as intelligent or whatever it may be this like the other day that one of the things that is like so just ridiculous about how Thalia is so hard on him in this book is that like the literal reason why you are alive again is because of Percy <laughs> like he's the one that got like the 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 thing back so that you could even come back to life and all you do is yell at him <laughs> it's like he probably leans on the fact that um Clarice is the one who actually brought it to camp like she's probably like yeah Percy grabbed it but Clarice is the one who brought it to me. <laughs> oh my god. Um, but it's I think I think that's the thing with him is that and I it's a very like scapegoat thing. I, I feel like I say that a lot, but it's just true that when there's people like people who are manipulative and abusive and stuff, they can somehow like just like there's like a scent or something, I swear, where yeah. they can just tell that we can read through their bullshit and we just like and they we like understand things or know things or like people genuinely care about us in a way that they don't understand because they think that you need to like use and manipulate people in order to get what you want like the idea of just like being a good person and then people like wanting to help you because they just care about you is something that people like that just like genuinely don't understand like, I am quite sure that throughout all of these books, Luke is, like, so confused <laughs> about why the kids at camp and Annabeth even and Grover and stuff like Percy so much or, like, care about him in the way that they're willing to, like, put themselves out there on the line and, like, get killed by him um, just to help Percy when they don't have to. And so I think that they go after him because they almost, like, want to punch that out of him. Like when you, they like can tell when you are somebody who actually cares about people and they just like almost want to like somehow ruin that about you and be like, I know that you actually feel this way, but I want to like ruin your life so that you stop believing in this. And it makes them so mad when it doesn't work. <laughs> and like, that's like Percy's whole thing is no matter what they do, there's always somebody around that he's treated like way better than they actually deserve um and that those people like help him out and in a time when you wouldn't think so like like the end of sea of monsters when luke is about to kill him and all of a sudden chiron just shows up out of nowhere mm -hmm. it's that it's like that kind of stuff and so the fact that they can't beat him like that like they can't make him like stop being a good person basically they just are going to be relentless with him because they are they just want him to not be like that anymore <laughs> they're like stop acting like you're a good person and it's like that's not actually an act though <laughs> yeah this is just who i am i'm sorry because <laughs> yeah, like when you look at like Th somebody left a comment on one of my Thalia videos at some point in the last couple days that was like accurate where they were like i don't know where i heard this but they said like percy does everything he can to stop the prophecy being passed to somebody younger than him and thalia does everything possible to dump it on somebody younger than her like she does everything possible to get away from it so that she doesn't want it so she doesn't have to do it and he does everything to keep it to the extreme detriment of himself and it's like yeah yeah and so like they wouldn't want to go with somebody like thalia because she might like electrocute them <laughs> or just fight back like fight back more in a way that they wouldn't like they she might not agree with their plans and things like that like i just imagine that thalia and luke would like actually try to kill each other probably yeah um okay so um one thing that percy um witnesses before he gets um figured out is them planting teeth and this comes from it's used a few times in mythology but the big one is the jason and medea myth which um 
you plant a drac dracon dragon um you know if you want to spell it the ancient greek way or you want to spell it the english way um so they plant the teeth and it turns into soldiers but whatever mortal person they enchanted ended up grabbing saber tooth tiger teeth if if that somehow worked if that spell somehow worked then wouldn't those be like mini beasts like they're baby beasts still so they're still useful but just like they need to grow up a little bit um the other thing kind of about this mythology is so they say that they're watering it and um percy basically hints that it's blood he's like it's something red and it ain't hawaiian punch um that's not in the mythology they they water they just say to sow the teeth like they're seeds so I don't know if that's just like an extra monstery touch or where it came from. Um, I mean, there's water content in blood, so I, I guess it would work with like it's water with extra nutrients when you really think about it. But it's so weird that like and it's also very brutal, of course, because these are monsters. Where did that blood come from? Why do they have enough to not only water the accidental saber tooth tiger teeth, but when they actually get to a dragon's teeth? They like they can still have enough to water it. How much blood do they have on store? They just got all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, so the other thing, when they get the second pair of teeth, that's the successful one. He says to grab them from the T Rex, and um, then you know Luke makes a little comment. This is why I never trust mortals. They say that the T-Rex turned out to be Sybaris herself. Now, I looked up this dragon. She is a she-dragon that lives on the mountains outside of Delphi and basically is terrorizing shepherds and villagers and stuff. Um, eventually, they decide that the way they're going to appease this dragon is by sacrificing this young man named Alcinius, I think is how you say it. And um, then another dude who was like, that, that guy's way too beautiful to die. He's so beautiful. I'm in love with him. I will go in his place. And so that guy's name is Eurybatis. And Eurybatis ends up slaying her. So um, it's kind of interesting that it's a little male on male love story. And this is before Rick got explicitly like super pro LGBT, but that's like a little hint of one, in my opinion. Yeah, they're definitely, he would, there, yeah, there's definitely hints in these books about that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up real quick about what luke said about like oh i don't this is why i don't trust any mortals i'm like so are you terrorizing selena for fun yeah because if you don't trust mortal she's definitely a mortal girl um okay (laughs) like just thinking about what happens to her and i'm like so did you put did you did you put her through all of that still not thinking that she actually means anything like i know that's true yeah but you should get run over by a truck <laughs> yeah like are you saying all of these demigods who you've enlisted to help you at this point which i don't know how many we just know that there's lost campers and that could mean either they joined the other side or they're dead um but if any of that joined his side what does that mean for them and chris rodriguez at least is still with him at this point um yeah. so that's fun yeah, it's like, oh, okay, great. You don't trust me with certain tasks. Um, why am I here? Yeah, or like, I guess it's also the thing of like, what is it about? Why do you trust monsters? Is it because you think that they're less smart than you? And you Probably. feel like you can manipulate them easier and just get them to do what you want? Because mm-hmm. that's probably what it is, because he's a xenophobic little freak. Yeah. But still, I just have to yell about that because somehow the like the like ableism and like general xenophobia of him saying to tiny little Percy in the first book that anyone who doesn't join him like thinks Prometheus did. So maybe he's maybe that's supposed to be a little pro. So that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So when they these um, soldiers start coming up from the teeth, one thing that they said that I don't quite know how this fits in yet, but no weapons known to Half-Blood or Hunters are going to stop these ones. And that immediately, I think that's the moment where Percy was like, oh shit. And um, one of the the Drakaini um, holds up like what looks like some Hunters 
piece of clothing or something and you know they ask do you have the scent and that's when percy gives away that he is there invisible he jumps on them i i can't remember if he he does snatch the scarf but in the process they rip his clothes and have his scent now so even though he he fixed the problem he created a new one at the same time and he is able to luckily somehow sneak out even though they realize okay he's here and it has to be percy he's able to run out before they can trap him in the room mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> i'm just saying yeah because that's you know that's percy's um fatal flaw which is just self-sacrifice he didn't do it on purpose this time um but it's also just a thing that he's not going to care as much if he's the one that they're going after even though he obviously doesn't want that to happen but it's also a thing of i don't want this to be them going after somebody else though like where all of my friends are right now um at this point in like the quest he's still like trying to watch where they're going without them without directly talking to them and so i think he's just trying to help them without them realizing that he's there because why would he think that they would let him stay (laughs) like he has every reason to think that if they realize he's there that they'll make him go back to camp but he doesn't want to do that um yeah just like their little mysterious like you know like guardian angel person like trying to help them without having to actually talk to them but that you know that goes flying out the window very quickly (laughs) but that's like i think what he's trying to do here is like oh well if these things chase me then i guess i'll just have to deal with it and at least they won't be chasing the rest of them well yes and no because he he takes off the cap after that and runs into the space museum and so he does want them to see him and i think that's partially because he knows that they said there's already a monster over there to deal with them um so he is going to warn them he's like i don't care if they see me at this point But I do think up before then, his plan was, I'm just going to hang back invisible. I don't know what he was going to do after he sent Blackjack away, maybe try to sneak onto the bus with them or something. But I do think he was planning on just remaining invisible for as long as possible, just to hang around. Yeah. Yeah, like, I think this part is one of those things that I think is funny about Percy is that this part is... 100% 100% fuel, fueled on pure panic. Mm-hmm. Like, he's just panicking. <laughs> like, he's just panicking this entire time. He's like, oh shit. Like, Luke is here, and with all these, like, this scary general guy from my dreams is here. Like, the Dr. Thorne guy is here. Now they're like, now these undead things are chasing me, and there's also some unknown monster that's about to kill everyone on this quest and if they all die then annabeth's definitely gonna die and yeah. i don't want grover to die or like folly or the rest of them even to die so it's it's pure it's just panic like like i think it's funny when people read these books and they think that he's like it, they they describe it as like oh he's impulsive and he just like or in a good way like he makes like snap decisions in the moments and i'm like do you mean that he's driven completely on complex PTSD? <laughs> because <laughs> that's what's actually happening right now. Like, he just heard that a monster is about to attack people he likes, and he's just, just panicking. And yeah. figuring out the, the quickest possible way for him to get there to find out if they're dead yet. <laughs> like, he's not really, there's not a lot of thinking up there. You're just, like, reacting really quickly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and a thing that goes unspoken in both of these chapters is Annabeth was in that room. So he did leave behind Annabeth to go save the rest of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was like there's obviously more clear and present danger on that group because they have no idea. He at least knows they're keeping Annabeth alive and they have her prisoner here. So I guess that's the one thing that like could be going on in his mind of like, I'll deal with that later. Yeah, it's like there's only so many fires you can put out at a time. You have to like pick the one that is the most like in danger of you right now. And to, for that, it's whatever is going on with everybody else. And so yeah. he's just going to go to that one first. Yeah. So then we pick up in the next chapter where, um, let's see. So he runs across to the Air and Space Museum and he ends up finding them in front of the Apollo space capsule. Um, and first thing that Grover says when he <laughs> reads the group is, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I, that was, I could like 
literally like hear Orion's voice yep. in my head of when he was like, oh, thank God Percy is here. And then him be like, oh, wait, I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah. oh, Percy, it's nice to see you. What like someone who might grasp the like concept of what they're trying to do is here without getting in a stupid fight about nothing. <laughs> Yeah, at this point, he has to be so frustrated with Talia and Zoe. I'm, I'm sure that song is going to come out again. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, now I'm picturing him trying to sing the consensus song to, like, Zoe. <laughs> and especially because they're, they're on, he's, like, doing his magic. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, like, they're, like, questioning every single stupid thing he does, but they're also using him. So yeah. it's like one of those things of like, do you want me to be here or not? Like, you're letting me bring you all the way here. Why don't you shut up for 10 seconds and stop questioning whether I'm doing, whether I'm actually doing something? Because I'm pretty sure that it's working. <laughs> like, at least with Percy and Annabeth, like, they didn't sit there and be like, are you sure this is right? Are you sure you're doing the right thing? Are you sure you can find Anne? Yeah. <laughs> like, all that kind of stuff. It's like, shut up. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Percy runs in, he warns them all, generals next door, they're sending monsters over, um, all of these warriors pop up, and Talia at first was angry that he was there, I'm sure she was like, he's trying to show me up, um, what is this boy doing, and then when he's like, there's some warriors on the way, she, she snaps back into reality and she's like, how many? Um, let's go, <laughs> you know, what are we doing? Which I do appreciate about her, at least like, at least she was able to step aside of her own feelings in that moment and be like, okay, we got it. We got to get through this. And I thought the thing I thought was interesting about her is that when he mentions that Luke is here is when she starts like, like freaking out herself because she doesn't want to see him mm -hmm. and is like trying to avoid as long as possible for she actually has to deal with him. Yeah. Um, so that's like really the thing that gets like her attention the most is that Luke is like not only here, but he's like on his way over to like beat her face in <laughs> and yeah. it's like <laughs> like and especially with zoe right there like i can't remember if this line has happened yet or not but at some point in these chapters zoe says something about like oh you you never know when to leave boys behind yeah she and, says he's that. Talking, and he's talking about luke and and like and thalia looks like she's about to like stab her <laughs> <laughs> when she's because she's so mad that she would talk about it that way yeah it's because talia becomes on board with percy being there first yeah. and that's why she's like oh you never could leave those boys behind but percy ends up proving himself we'll get back to mr d's little little rant because um the next thing that happens is they're attacked by the nemean lion now i didn't realize when i told my own nemean lion story on here that i was remembering this scene i was like I remember somebody shooting him, shooting the Nemean lion in the mouth because the traditional <laughs> way that the Nemean lion got killed is strangulation. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't know why that stuck in my memory, but it is kind of genius. And Percy notices that as they are fighting this lion, it is doing its best not to open its mouth, which that is one of its literal weapons, you know, is its teeth. And it's also like barely opening its eyes, which means that would be another point that you could potentially hit it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and let's see the the way they describe the Nemean's lions. Nemean lions' fur is interesting too. It's kind of described as if it's metallic, and when Percy strikes it with his sword, sparks fly off like metal on metal um i have never heard it described that way you know it's always kind of more it's a regular lion that just has this magical property to it um but that was kind of an interesting way to put it that like it actually feels metallic mm -hmm. let's see um we have talia chasing it back with igis and it kind of is working um but percy notices cat behavior it's starting to like shrink up like it's gonna pounce and that's when Percy decides that he's going to step into the battle. Yeah. And it's like, oh, hi. Hi, guys. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, shit. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I appreciated also Zoe being like, you could use your ugly shield. <laughs> and I was like, I'll take anyone not liking the fact that she has 
Medusa on her shield, even if she does kind of say something derogatory about her, I'll get over that later. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I like, I just like anything that where anyone points out, like, your shield is gross. Yeah. Why don't you go use it, I guess, and turn him into the biggest statue of all time? Yeah. So we have Percy jumping around on different things in the Space Museum. He's like literally on airplanes and spaceships and stuff while mm -hmm. he's trying to get away from this lion that is actively slashing at him. And then he shouts at Zoe, aim for the mouth. Um, it isn't working though, because again, it's keeping everything closed tight. It knows that that's a vulnerability point and it's doing its best to not get hit there. Um, so then Percy says, I have an idea. And his idea was like one of those ones that's so genius that only he could have thought of it, you know, like, um, which is he remembers as a kid, I went to the um, souvenir store here and I thought I would try space food and it was terrible. So he goes to the score store, he rushes past a person who's just like hiding, isn't even caring that he went in and stole a bunch of space food. And he starts unwrapping packages and throwing them straight in the lion's mouth so that Zoe has an opening to shoot it in the mouth. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and because like when the food gets in the mouth, it gets like bigger or mm -hmm. something. Either way, like this is the kind of stuff that this is the kind of stuff that abused kids think of. We're very scrappy. <laughs> we like don't yeah. have anything that we're actually supposed to have going through life. And so, yeah, he would be like, oh, what can I shove in his mouth that will, like, make it harder for him to keep his mouth closed? Like, that's something that's actually here that I could actually use. And, yeah. of course, he's the one that thinks of something like that because everyone else is too busy trying to think of, like, strategy or whatever. And it's like, fuck strategy. <laughs> like, just go with whatever is, like, closest to you. So that you're not dead anymore. That's the that's the goal, right? Like, what would these people have done if Percy never showed up? Yeah, because he's doing every, literally everything. Like he's jumping all over this museum, and it was fun. I remember being in this this part of the museum, so I was like picturing it exactly in my head of where he was. But I'm like, he's ruining this museum, but also he's the one that's like fighting this giant thing. Everyone else has no idea what they're doing. Mm -hmm. like, no clue like zoe is so like big and bad but she is just like shooting arrows that do absolutely nothing she's not doing anything that's helpful like him and grover are the ones that were helpful well it's, he's directing everybody when you think about it <laughs> he tells grover round up the children that are running around screaming and so grover you know makes sure all the mortals are out of the way he tells talia at one point you know distract it for me and that's when she starts fighting it directly he tells Zoe, shoot it in the mouth. So he was literally the only one coming up with any sort of strategy there. And it's interesting because at the beginning with Capture the Flag, we had, you know, Talia going with classical strategy, but putting herself at the forefront and Percy wanting to be more go with the flow. Here's where we see in certain situations, go with the flow and flexibility is going to save your ass. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause nothing, nothing is ever going to go the way that you want. You need somebody to kind of just be like, okay, what is everybody's strengths? How do I, how do I work in a situation where it works for everybody instead of just thinking like, this is what I want to do. How do I, it's like the thing of like, if you look at a, a plan generally in life, especially, but if you look at something as like, I want to do this, what do I do to get these people to do things so I can do the thing that I want to do? Yeah. then nothing is going to work. But if you look at the situation for what it actually is, and you're like, how do we get out of here okay? And you just like, that's what he's doing. He's just like, what do I, what can I get these people to do so that this thing dies? He doesn't, he's not thinking about like, what can I do so that I can kill it? He's like, I don't care if I'm the one who kills it or not. Like, what can I do to just make this go as fast as possible? And that's why he's always successful at these things because he's not caught up on what he should be doing or what somebody else should be doing it's like okay but what is actually happening <laughs> exactly that's, that's the only thing that matters if if percy had gone with like a talia strategy he would be both clinging to a spaceship and trying to stab the lion in the mouth at the same time so he wouldn't have a good hold on where he's hanging from 
Plus, you know, he's he's kind of opening up a whole side of his body to that animal, um, and which is why he's like, okay, the hunters are a great shot. I'm going to tell one of them, go shoot it for me. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, during this whole thing, I'm also thinking about how, like, Bianca is here. And I'm like, like why is she? This is like, I know I said this already last time, but I'm like, why is she here? Like, she's 12. Like, even if she's now, like, magically immortal, she can be eaten and die just like everybody else. She can't do anything to help. She doesn't even know what's going on. She's, like, three days ago, she didn't even know that she is good to do this stuff. She doesn't even know who her, like, immortal parent is yet or anything like that. And she's just in this room with a giant lion trying to rip their heads off. It's like, yeah. <laughs> she is no help whatsoever, because how could she? She's a tiny little kid, and it's just like watching all of this stuff happen. It's like, why would you bring her on this quest? Well, I have to imagine, too, like, she's only three days into this transformation, which we've seen is somewhat slow. It's faster than it would be for a normal human. The last time that Percy saw her, he remarked she looked stronger. She looked like she was a little bit glowy. Um, but I would imagine it still takes time for them to develop a good shot with their bow and arrow that it probably still takes time to be able to recognize monsters even. She hasn't known they existed yet. Um, yeah. And like, yeah. I'm, like thinking, I'm like thinking about like Percy when he was 12. Mm -hmm. And But like the thing about him, of course, that is different from, especially uh, Bianca and Nico, is that like, they don't, like, they obviously don't remember this yet, but Bianca and Nico have spent most of their lives in the, um, in the casino and in las vegas and so they're they they were fine like growing up they were fine they were just like playing games and having fun for like most of their life that they can actively remember there were things that weren't that great that happened before they got shoved in there um but they don't really they don't remember that and so i guess the point i'm trying to make is that the reason why percy at tiny little percy at age 12 could deal with all of the things that he was is because he was used to people trying to beat him up or yeah. like hurt him on a regular basis at school at home everywhere he went and so people getting mad at him and yelling at him and trying to kill him like the things that were trying to kill him were much bigger and more powerful but it wasn't like a new experience for him so he could just like react to this stuff because it was just like okay i've definitely dealt with this before it's just like, how do I stop somebody who has more powers to hurt me than like the bullies that I dealt with at school or Gabe? But like Bianca didn't grow up like that. Like she didn't have that sort of experience at all. And so she genuinely would have absolutely no idea how to even fight somebody at this point. Like how would she even know something like that? And even if she has like super strength or however they put it for the hunters, how would she she wouldn't even know like how where to start she's never even been like listened to them even like strategize at this point maybe a little bit for like the hunters but the hunter strategy sucks ass so, so like one of their people was stupid enough to fall for an obvious trick and they just didn't replace them and like granted you know percy took their spot but like that's a horrible plan to leave on a quest like this down one person just because the one you wanted to bring got tricked like this is a terrible plan <laughs> and so she just doesn't there's no way that she could have any idea about what she's doing she's just like watching all of this for some reason like yeah. I, I don't know why I don't I just don't get it <laughs> like maybe something that Zoe does later on will explain to me why she did this but yeah. at this point I just really don't understand why she why she did that <laughs> yeah and i mean the fact after they slay the median lion um it turns out the guards are running around in circles because grover managed to play barry manilow to confuse them and so they don't know what they're quite looking for and the Nemean lions like slowly melting away until it becomes just a pelt and here's where we have zoe finally giving Percy the recognition she that he deserves. She's like, you should grab that. And he's like, okay, first of all, what is it? She's like, it's a spoil of your, your battle. Like you go grab it. And he's like, but you're the one who did the shot. And she says, no, like that was your plan that that won us. And 
she accepts him being on the quest, which going back to the Mr. D thing that I pointed out earlier when he's like, you know, what do these women think of heroes? Just ask Zoe Nightshade. I feel like Zoe saying you're okay to go on this quest after she put up such a fight in it initially is her vouching for him and being like, you know what? Maybe you are one of the decent ones. Yeah, like you proved yourself. You just did all of that. How can I sit there and say that you don't deserve to be here when you just saved everybody's life? Yeah. And also here, have a jacket so you don't freeze to death <laughs> since we don't have any clothes to wear. Yeah, and Percy, he's like ready to accept that he's not going on this quest finally because he's like, these monsters have my scent. You should, you should go far away from me and I'll lead them back. Um, but she's like, no, you're coming with us. We were supposed to bring five. I mean, and what also has me thinking about this what was she scared of you know like with bringing him initially he's not attracted to bianca bianca is way too young for well not way too young i mean like reasonably kids those age would date but like he's not attracted to her he's very clearly like having his little friend slow burn romance with um annabeth already especially considering his reaction to her getting taken um Zoe's obviously not going to fall for any of his crap, even if he did try to seduce her or something. The girl Phoebe that they were going to take originally, like the one thing that they've said about her is, oh, that's the girl who hit us on the head and captured the flag. Um, so I don't see any romance budding there. What was she scared of? <laughs> I, I know I know what it is. Um... I just don't know how to answer that without without giving away stuff about Zoe. We can put a pin um, in that one, but it's just it's interesting. Remember, it, there is like a very good reason, I think. Like, it does make sense to me. Like, Zoe aggravates me, but um, I actually really like her as a character. And I, um, I understand her a lot about what her motivations are. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember that from when I, and it's kind of amazing that I remember anything at all. So like, it means that I actually really liked her, um, that I remember that about her. And she does like Percy a lot more mm -hmm. as he goes on. She ends up really liking him by the end. Um, and she has every reason to by the time they get to the end. But she does have, I think she does have a reason for why she didn't want him to go. and. I'm pretty sure that he re realizes it also at a certain point when she tells him stuff about <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but even like now, I think there also could be a thing that I don't know what Artemis like has said about him or like the other gods have said about him too. Like they're obviously talking shit about him like when they're around being the most ridiculous, abusive little bitches in the whole world. So they all are like giving him weird looks in this book where they're obviously all talking about him. Mm -hmm. And so it just makes me wonder if she's heard stuff about him already that makes her even more predisposition to just think that something is off about him. And especially because of the capture the flag stuff, like if she thought that if she thought that Thalia was like the one in the right there because she was a girl, that they it would be very easy for her to just be like, no, you're you're an out of control man who doesn't boy, but still like who doesn't have any control over your emotions. So I don't want you to come. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even though that's not what happened, but like I don't think that she would even think that Thalia, even though she doesn't like Thalia, <laughs> I don't think that she would think that Thalia was the one in the wrong in that situation, especially since Percy even himself said at some point that he thought that it was his fault. Um, yeah. So just those things that I can actually talk about would be enough, I think. Yeah. For her yeah. To just I'm not ready for the spoiler because I totally forgot what her story is. I mean, the only hint we have so far is that she was betrayed at, by a hero at some point. Yeah, those are two different things. Okay. Like this, the thing of how she's but kind of, I guess. Yeah, it basically. Like, the story of why she doesn't, like, want him around and other things is a separate thing, but the reason why she um, doesn't trust heroes is something very different. Like, there was a big hint that, like, Chiron 
when he was at camp and Chiron was talking to him in his cabin, he said, like, don't talk about this thing around Zoe. Mm -hmm. um, that was a hint to, like, at least what what is involving, like, that part for when it comes to her. But those are two different things that yeah. happened to her. Yeah. Um, but that's where we leave off with these chapters. Uh, and, you know, the action makes them go by super fast um, because these are very action packed chapters. Um, but we know he's on the quest now. He's been accepted as the fifth member, um, which means potentially he could be the one who dies or the one who gets lost um, as Mr. D wanted. But um, I think that that's also part of why he let him go is he probably realized he was meant to be the fifth member as he was giving him shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at some point, Mr. D's just gonna let him go because he gets annoyed fast enough. Um, yeah. I will say that the end of these of this chapter, like when Zoe had like a reaction to something, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's like also a little hint if you've never read these books before or don't remember them anymore, um, what some of her backstory is just based on how she reacts. It's like my favorite thing with her to notice all these little things about the way that she responds to stuff. I'm like, oh, I know what this means now. And I actually, and I actually remember it this time as opposed to all the years when I read these books before and I was dissociating for every second of my life. <laughs> and so it's, it's fun to see her like I, yeah, she would, she would not be like pleased to, to hear like, what's about to happen. I'm honestly like it really interested to see what happens in the next the next chapters we read because I don't remember what happened. Yeah, what happens, but they we don't find out. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that we don't find out about her whole backstory stuff until later on. And so something happens with that where she doesn't have to give it all away yet. Yeah. Right, that's that's I don't even I don't remember. <laughs> um let's see so i think the one there's a couple things that i didn't touch upon that i made notes on um of course i have to remark on the general when we finally see him he's wearing a silk suit um that is expensive so um because silk is um as a natural fiber <laughs> silk is one of those ones that's considered luxury because it, you you basically have to boil silkworms alive to make it um and also like has to be hand spun because um a silk <laughs> i'm gonna go into like fashion stuff that i'm learning in like fiber but um silkworms it's one continuous thread when they make their cocoon and so um like to get the prestigious one continuous thread because one continuous thread means it's not gonna have any notches or um bumps in it they boil them alive and then somebody will then like stretch it out and try to piece like try to untangle it um because it's also stuck together with something called saracen gum that boils off so um yeah he has a very luxury suit on um and then with mr d something that came to my mind as i was reading um how he said he was punished um let's see so we know his punishment is for a specific thing. It's for going after a wood nymph that was off limits. Um, but what his punishment reminded me of is it's actually close to what happens to gods when they break an oath on the river Styx. Um, I just reread this in the Theogony with William. So when you break an oath that you swore on the river Styx, um, you have one year where you are basically comatose in bed. You can't breathe, you can't speak, you can't have nectar or ambrosia. You have to be by yourself, isolated, comatose. Then for another nine years, you are separated from the gods and you can't go into any feasts, any councils or any of that. So it seems like his punishment is a lesser version of that because it, he can still go to the feasts and councils and stuff but he is in a period of isolation because he's not with his wife and he's not on Olympus. Yeah, interesting. One thing too is when they were talking about Luke's ship mm -hmm. and the general was like, your ship is annoying and I don't like it. And of course, Luke was like, I spent a year getting these monsters to kill people for me. Um, and, but one thing that he does say, he references the mountain. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there are lots of mountains in California. Yep. Well, there's that. <laughs> um, I still don't know what any of that actually means. <laughs> I don't remember like what mountain. I remember that it happens on a mountain, but I don't remember anything else. And the only reason I remember that happens on the mountain, I'm laughing already, but it's like one of my, my favorite like Thalia scene of all time is when she pushes him off, pushes Luke off of the top of the mountain off of the cliff. And yeah. it's like, fuck you, bro. <laughs> like the best I like legitimately picture with like with like uh, Charlie's face <laughs> like how, how great that would look to see somebody just be like get go go away stop stop villain monologuing at me already <laughs> um, yeah. so I know because of that that happens on like a cliff or something or other but that was like a little uh, like what one of those little like tidbits of like what does that mean and it's like it means something because there's lots of mountains in California, mm-hmm. and like every hint possible so far that there there's something about California. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the underworld we know is in Los Angeles, which means that Tartarus would also, I guess, be in Los Angeles or connected to. No. Hmm. Okay. That was my guess, though. It like the entrance to it. Uh, Tartarus is like so confusing. Um, like it's not like confusing, I guess, but it's just like a, a different like concept. So like, uh, when Percy and Annabeth fall into Tartarus in the House of Hades book, they're in Rome. Oh. Um, every once in a while, I see videos of Percy Jackson fans that are on vacation in Rome, and they go to like the exact spot where it happened because it's like an accident. Really? Is it and, a furnace? Like I a, don't yeah, I don't remember anymore. But it's it like an actual like building there that they just say it happened in. Um, and so they're like that part where they fall. But so there's like the entrance to Tartarus that you see in the in like the first book and the first show, the first season of the show that's in the underworld. But like they fall forever. And so it's not like you just like, it's not like the underworld where you just like walk down some stairs and you're just like, yeah, so they they fall for like eight days before they actually get to Tartarus. So that's mythologically sound. So um, to say that equal distance from Olympus to Earth. It is from Earth to Tartarus. So they said it, it like, I forget what the exact verbiage is in the Theogony, but it's something like, if you were to drop an anvil off of Olympus, it would take nine days for it to fall to Earth. But if you were to drop it from Earth, it would also take nine days for it to fall into Tartarus. So yeah, yeah. that's why that like one thing that you posted on your Instagram about Percy and Annabeth falling into Tartarus, where she just like hugs him and keeps saying I love you every once in a while. And she says her like, her it's her point of view when you're reading that part of the beginning of that book where she says like if we're gonna die i want i love you to be the last words he ever hears from anybody but she does she keeps doing that as they're like fall because they're falling for eight days and they're just like, they're falling they don't and they don't even know like what's gonna they don't even know how to stop themselves when they get down there like they easily could have just fallen and then just died once they actually got down to tartarus if Percy wasn't there with her, she would have just died when she got to like the end. Um, and so it's one of those things of it's not as e- it's like a really scary like idea in this in these stories because of how severe it is. And just to like um, remind for like the millionth time that Luke's plan in season one was for tiny little 12 year old Percy to fall down into Tartarus for eight days by himself. Mm-hmm. He didn't even know how to use his like powers yet. And then he probably would have died when he got down into Tartarus because he didn't know he didn't he didn't know how to use like his water powers yet like that to like use it to like stop himself. Maybe he would have done it because he would have been panicking in the way that he did use his powers every time he just like started panicking during that season. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that was his plan to make a like tiny little 11, 12 year old, sixth grade Percy fall into Tartarus by himself for eight days and then make Kronos be in his body 
and shove him into that sarcophagus so that he didn't have to do it. Like Luke looks so bad in in these chapters and the rest of this book and the next one because Kronos is like sucking out his energy and replaced and replacing it with his own. And like he just wanted to do all of this without actually having to like be in danger himself. Yeah. He just was yeah. like, yeah, I want to like destroy the entire world and kill everybody, but I don't want to have to do like, why would I want to put myself in danger, even though I'm putting literally everyone else I've ever met in serious danger or killing them. Like he just wanted to use Percy as a way to get around that. So he didn't have to do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but he it didn't work. And so he, now he, ha he actually has to do it. And he's, and I think, I think that's just so funny and like an abusive way that that's the thing that is like the thing that upsets him the most is that he physically is having to like actually do this because he couldn't find somebody else yet that he could manipulate to take his place. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's the thing that's upsetting you right now. Yeah. You're like, I really everyone. want to take your place. Like that sounds like an awful punishment to have your energy slowly zapped. Like what reward is Kronos promising in exchange for his body? Like nothing. Pretty yeah. much it's the whole idea of like, I'm so cool, don't you want me in your body? Like like sort of a sort of a deal, like I'm so cool and big and bad. Like please let me just like take you no. Like no even as manipulative as Luke is, I don't think he was I mean, he must have tried really hard <laughs> to, to find somebody to do it for him. I mean, he really tried with um with Percy for a while. He tries in this book with Thalia, he tries in this book, in the next one, like Annabeth, he does literally everything he could possibly think of to try to get himself out of it before it's, it, it's just like, before he finally has to admit defeat and accept that he's actually having to do this. Yeah. But he really does try, I'm sure he tried to get like other people that we don't even know to do it for him too, but it's all, the thing also with Kronos is that he wants somebody who's powerful um and so he doesn't even like one of the things that's like amazing about luke is that chronos is never happy that he is the one that is like his vessel and so he's putting himself through all this shit he's the ultimate golden child he's put, he's putting himself through all of this shit sucking out his like life essence everything that makes him an individual person on his own to try to make like the crazy abusive grandfather happy and like pleased with him but he's never happy with him because he always wanted percy instead yeah because he wanted somebody who was like can you imagine the stuff that chronos would be able to do with percy's powers that would be absolutely terrifying the kind of stuff he could do with like water powers like that like percy gets scared sometimes and accidentally makes hurricanes without even meaning to because he's just terrified yeah but chronos is never never once actually happy with him and he just keeps trying to do things to make him happy and never stops and is like what am i doing right now <laughs> but he yeah. never gets there and at this point luke is in way too deep to even turn back like what's he gonna do one day say oh i want to be with the demigods again and think that he's just gonna get away with it he literally has chronos infecting his body yeah, and also like even if even if they could somehow get Kronos out of his body, it's like you have killed people. Yeah. Like you, you have killed like kids that like that you know. You have like destroyed people's lives. Like you've terrorized and traumatized everyone that you ever met who ever loved you. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what did you think was gonna happen? You would just like be like, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And it's like, I don't care. <laughs> like, yeah, you made a mistake, but your mistakes were kind of like high level mistakes, <laughs> like really big high level mistakes that cost people like their entire lives or just destroyed relationships that should never have had to go through stuff like that. It's just like, you tried to murder at least one kid like three different times at this point. I don't really think he's going to care if you're like, oh, I made a mistake. This mean guy was just saying the right things to me. And it's like, I don't, I don't care anymore. Yeah. I mean, we, we know he was terrorizing mortals about, uh, aboard the Queen Andromeda just to be probably monster food. Um, it's one of those irredeemable, like, it, it makes me think back to Anakin again. 
Because that the scene that is where you know that Anakin has reached a path that is completely irredeemable is when he goes to the younglings. And, you know, it's the one that gets clipped all the time of, of the youngling coming out of hiding, like, Master Luke, or not Mas Master Anakin. And then he, like, draws his, his lightsaber, and you're just like, <laughs> what? Yeah, and Anakin is a good example for that kind of thing, that people with, like, people like that, I think they just, like, delude themselves into believing that they could somehow save them. Mm -hmm. Or that if they just, like, talk to them, they could somehow figure out a way to help them. Like, that's basically Annabeth through the first five books yeah. with Luke not wanting to just admit that there's no going back. And, like, the only way that you can do that is to, like, lessen the, the like, absolute horrible things that they do to other people that hurt them. And mm -hmm. so the way that happens in Percy is that Annabeth, like, finds herself downplaying the things that he does to Percy because that's the only way that she could possibly think that is she downplays the fact that he's tried to murder him when he was 12 and when he was 13 and when he was 14 and when he was like all those all those ages but like you have to you have to downplay that stuff in the same way that with like Anakin like uh Padme sits there and listens to him be like I'm sad that my mom was hurt so I just murdered a bunch of innocent beings who didn't hurt her didn't kill her yeah um, yeah the sand people yeah, like he just murdered an entire, like he just did a genocide, small, his first genocide. <laughs> he did like a low, low key genocide, like because it's a small group of people, but he, he just did genocide against a group of people that is supposed to represent George Lucas deserves to be slapped because the, the sand people are absolutely supposed to be like the indigenous population of the Middle East. Ugh. And so he deserved to be slapped. The fact that he made them like these weird looking like creatures that can't speak a normal language and look strange that when Anakin murders all of them, people don't like, it doesn't like hit people as much, like how bad it actually is what he actually just did. And it's just like the fact that Padme heard him say that and saw him do that and was there still like is. something yeah. good in him that I can save. And it's like, no, there isn't. If he was able to just kill a bunch of people like that with his like powers that he's been given because he was angry, then there's no limits to the kind of stuff he's willing to do to other people. And that's that's like the whole thing with Percy. Like Annabeth doesn't want to admit that if Luke is willing to take Percy out into the forest by himself to kill him in the books or try to convince him to join him and then try to kill him if he doesn't join him in in like the tv show version either way he's he's like willing to do that to this kid then he's willing to do anything yeah if you're willing to do something like that to a 12 year old kid then there's no limits to what you are willing to do to people that you see as like your peer mm -hmm. and it's, it's like that whole thing. They don't want to admit it. Like, it's the same thing with like Kylo, like Kylo Ren. Like one thing that I liked a lot about Star Wars with um, the sequel trilogy, like why the sequel trilogy is my favorite one out of all of them, is that like they have the moment with Kylo or Ben in the first movie where um, Han offers to like, just like come home with me. Yeah. And it's like yeah. a thing of like, I'm not saying that everything that you've done so far is okay. Like he also murdered like 20 of his closest friends yeah. and yeah. At, at the Jedi Academy and everything. So it's not like he didn't do anything horribly wrong, but it's also a thing of like, at least I can stop this. We can like stop this here so it doesn't progress any further than it's gone already. And, you know, Kylo uh, stabs him in the chest and kills him. And so like they do that moment of like somebody wanting to give them a chance to like pull themselves back in the first movie instead of in the later movies. Um, so I like, that's why I liked that one better that they just like got that one done and over with pretty early on. Yeah. And like, I think that's why I like the Percy Jackson stuff is that Percy realizes that because of what Luke does to him at the end of the first book. Mm -hmm. And, but the hard part about it is that nobody else does. Yeah, well, Percy has been killed by him the least amount of time, so that's yeah. really the only reason he's able to. If well, Luke also, had a few more months, maybe, I don't know. And the stuff that Luke does to him is, like, more, it's things that he can't ignore, I guess, mm -hmm. is, like, the thing about it. Like, the it's, like, the double thing of, especially with how they did it on the show, that 
Annabeth isn't there on the show when Grover almost gets like sucked into Tartarus. Mm -hmm. And so he sees how scary that is and he knows what that what that means. And yeah. they know that it's a really bad thing down there, even if he doesn't fully understand how bad it actually is, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That's something really scary. And he knows that Luke is the one that wanted to do that to him. Yeah. And yeah. so like realizing that somebody wanted to like that's why I like the TV show version better. Is that like because by the time they confront Luke, him and Annabeth have known for days by that point that he wanted to like send him down there and they were just able to stop it just by like pure like coincidence. But yeah. he knew for like they knew for days by that point that he was he wanted to do that, that that was his plan. And so when you know that about a person, it's like everything else about them you start looking at and like thinking about again and being like, who is this person actually? Because I thought he was being nice to me when he gave me these shoes. I thought he was giving me something to help me, but he was actually giving it to me so he could kill me. Yeah. Um, so this makes you like relook at every single thing they've ever said to you. And that's basically what Percy was doing, the TV show version, and Annabeth for that matter, in the days, in like the day or whatever, before they actually went out to talk to him. Mm -hmm. And like the way that, that happens on the show, I always like more because because I always picture that as like Annabeth and, and Percy hoping that they were be, that they were wrong about him. Yeah. Hoping that that was like their moment of hoping that they could get him to like stop what he was doing now and not have it go any further. Um, but he's not listening to anything that Percy says. He's just like, no, we're going to leave. Yeah. And Percy's like, I don't want to leave. <laughs> what are you talking about? I just got back to camp. I like it here. I don't want to leave. And he's like, we need to leave and get rid of like the oppressive things. And he's like, I like being here. <laughs> like, what do you mean? And so like, it doesn't work, but that's like, that was like them like testing him. Mm -hmm. They wanted him to be good. And then it was like, well, never mind. Yep. That's not going to work this time. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's a theme in like literature. We talked about Gollum recently. Gollum's yeah. like another example of, you know, this is somebody who I really identify and I want to save them. And I do think that for some of the demigods, maybe that's some of the motivation is I can see where Luke is coming from. All of them are similarly neglected or sometimes even emotionally abused by their parents, uh, their god parents. And so a lot of them can resonate with some of the things he's saying, but um, I, I feel like maybe some of them are thinking like, you know, someone says the right thing to me and this could happen to me too. So I like to think he could be saved because then I can be saved. Yeah, and it, it's also a thing of like, it just is how it is that even if you hear that someone has done something horrible, like that you know is really bad to somebody that even if you don't care about them, you just know that it's bad. Mm -hmm. There's this, this thing does happen to people that if you aren't like almost directly seeing it or experiencing it it's people can very easily kind of like separate themselves from it so that it doesn't it just they don't let themselves actually think about what that really means yeah. and so a lot of the kids at camp are like that where they just want to believe that luke could be better even though they hear these stories about how luke keeps trying to kill everybody they're not directly experiencing it some of the time at least and so it makes them want to hang on to like the image they had of him in the first place like it reminds me of like just abusive situations like family stuff like when you come to family or whoever and tell them about something that somebody like the best real life example i have of that is um i can't watch like donald trump uh he 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 is like he's so much like my dad like i can't i can't listen to him i can't look at his face i can't do anything with him because he he reminds me so much of him and yeah, like his president, his presidency was literally hell on earth. Like for me, I felt like he was still alive during all those years because he was acting the exact same. Like I always knew what he would do next as president because I would be like, what would my dad do? And I'd be like, he would do this. And that's like the exact thing that he would do. And it, anyway, my sister the other day was like, oh, didn't you watch the debate? It was so funny seeing all the stupidest things that he would say. And it's like, so she can like watch him and and listen to him and just laugh at him and find him funny and there's other things like that where she like can watch things that i can't watch or just like 
laugh about stuff that I can't. She'll like talk about songs that I like and be like, oh, I've never experienced something like this before. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and it's just, and it's that sort of a thing that even though she knows the things that my dad did to me, she mm-hmm. didn't like actually experience that stuff herself. Yeah. And so she can like separate herself from that somehow and still like not see him as dangerous of a person as I do because he directly did all those things to me. And it's the same thing that's happening with Luke that usually the worst stuff that Luke is doing is usually directed at Percy. Mm -hmm. And so somebody else isn't there. Like, I mean, some of the time they're literally there, like watching, watching Luke try to kill him and they still somehow come out of it being like, we can still save him somehow. And it's like, oh my God, can I just slap you for a second? Like, no, stop like putting all this effort into trying to kill him or trying to save him and understand that before he like kills you himself, like, or like kills me (laughs) for the love of God. Like, can you just understand? Um, They don't do that very well. They just, I know those are like coping mechanisms that people have. Mm-hmm. But it, it does mean that one day when people figure it out that we we should be allowed to be like, I told you so. Yeah. We don't, <laughs> but but I should be allowed to do every like scapegoat should be allowed to do that at least one time in the way. <laughs> to just like I was thinking about that today, and I'm like, yeah, I should be able to do that to so many people. I I won't <laughs> but, but I should. <laughs> Um, what was I going to say? Oh, the thing I was going to talk about too is the, there was a, there's like little tidbit things like. The other, the other kind of spoiler-ish things we got where we got a couple of set pictures. Mm-hmm. And one of them was at like a lake or something, like where they do their camp stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, somebody remembered the scene in Sea of Monsters where uh, Annabeth and Percy are talking and it's when they get in a fight because she's being mean about Tyson and people are like teasing him about Tyson and oh why don't you call yourself a monster and he's like leave me alone and and then she does the thing of like why don't you do the the chariot race with him if you like him so much and he's like okay <laughs> like it's, it's the like the one time where he says out loud like Tyson isn't my brother and he's like but he's not a monster either stop calling him a monster yeah like he let you into camp and everything right so it was just fun to see like that has to be what that the location of that scene because the guy tagged Walker and Leah so that obviously gives away of who is in that scene and then the other thing that just that they just posted like today is that they're filming for like two days at like a beach um and some of it's going to be in the water and some of it is going to be on land so they have to shut down the beach for those two days and that has to be luke and his bitch ass like ship yeah Um, it has to be those scenes of like and the thing that i that made me like very curious about them doing those scenes is that if if those like those casting call things about the character of allison was like accurate if she is like somebody who is on like luke's side or on his team Mm -hmm. then like she might be there because i was just thinking like i could see like the because we know from reading the book that luke is like hiding out basically like around miami the whole time that they're gone Mm -hmm. and so the fact that they have scenes that are like on the beach as well as in the water. I was like, I feel like they're doing some scenes where Luke, where like scenes of Luke, like Luke with his like monsters or Luke with his crew or whatever, and talking to them or showing them like strategizing that way or whatever they want to do, whatever they're doing with him to like have him be around more and be a series regular this season. Because it could be another scene, but I feel like it, it would make the most sense for it to be something with him and like his people and i was like i wonder if there's going to be anybody there that nobody knows (laughs) and it's going to be like that whoever that that person is Um, yeah maybe it 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 might not be there might be like some they might be having like them do some scene before they actually it might just be a scene of them like talking before getting on the hippocampier or whatever they might change 
like where they get on Luke's ship or something like that, but mm -hmm. it's not, and it's like added in scenes with Luke, and it and it kind of makes sense for it to be that regardless, since yeah. they're just like hanging out in Miami when they're in the Sea of Monsters. Um, either way, it'll yeah. be interesting to see what, what if people can like get anything from that because they'll probably be far away. <laughs> Yeah, um, the other interesting thing I wanted to point out is, so they had like a sign up with the fake name of the project. They <laughs> called it Mink Golden, which, golden <laughs> fleece, um, yeah. but they went with another animal fiber, it sounds like, because um, mink, of, of course, is an animal is used for its fur, but fleece is, you know, like the, the hair of a, a sheep specifically. So, yeah. Interesting. I, I told you this, but I, it's so funny to find out like what the funny like production names they give themselves because it's a thing like if you were walking down the street and you saw that there is a production called like Mink Fleece, you would be like, what the fuck is that? But if you like knew that it was Percy Jackson, you're like, oh, <laughs> it like always it always makes sense once you find out what it's actually supposed to be. But when you just see it, you're just like, what is that? <laughs> Like, I can't remember any of the names from things that I used to follow anymore, but they were always really funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing that happened, I guess, this week is that they put out, Rick Riordan put out a, like, um, I don't know what to call it, like a preview, I guess is the best word for it, for the new Percy Jackson book, the Triple Goddesses, like, book that's coming out in, like, two weeks that people were reading and that was fun i didn't read the whole thing because i haven't read like a lot of the new books and so i don't want to go back and read them now since we're doing this i'm like why would i do that now <laughs> but i do like reading little tidbits of stuff that is going on in the books and <laughs> i'm laughing because the main reason why i started reading it is because i saw i saw this video from somebody who was trying to say that like there's no signs of of percy having ptsd like the way they put it was like i'm waiting for an acknowledgement of ptsd and i was like have you read these books before like i don't mean to sound like that but i literally mean like have you read these books before <laughs> because that's just like a weird thing to say like to act like that he needs to like emphatically state like for the record i have complex ptsd and it's like no fucking shit like literally like the first two pages of the lightning thief is percy saying i've been kicked out of nine schools i see things that nobody else believes is there my stepdad makes me give him money and then hits me <laughs> like <laughs> what else do you need this well, what, what else is going on he went through so much before he even knew he was a demigod i mean like yeah we don't need anything else <laughs> That's why I was so confused, and and it was funny because I the parts of the like preview that I read was like him at the Met, the the or they were talking about the Met Museum in New York with it was like Annabeth and her friends that she's made at school, and they're just like oh if you would change the design of the Met what would you do, and he has an emotional flashback to the time that he was almost murdered at the Met when he was twelve. Miss Dodds. And, all he can think of is he literally says inside of his mind like all i can think of is that i would make a bunch of i would get rid of everything in the museum and just make a bunch of rooms with a bunch of uh like swords in them so that demigods wouldn't die when they were here yeah. and he just out loud he's just like i don't know <laughs> but i was just like <laughs> like this preview is like him thinking that annabeth's friends don't like him because they don't think that he's good enough for her mm -hmm. and then <laughs> and then and then him being like too traumatized to think of a fun like thought experiment and then like telling annabeth about their plan and annabeth wants to have a house party at hecate's house <laughs> and that's like where the the chapter ends like he's all worried about going on this quest and grover and annabeth are like this is going to be really fun and i'm like you are a literal like walking definition of PTSD straight out of the DSM-5. <laughs> like, this is really easy for me. Um, yeah, I don't know. that The person who said that, they had another video about Chalice of the Gods, which was the book Rick put out last year, where they were saying that, I guess in that book, there was a part where 
they're talking about how Percy and Annabeth and Grover were hanging out together. Mm-hmm. And she was saying that she, the person was saying that they thought it was out of character that Percy and Annabeth, like, weren't making friends at, like, at school. And they were just, like, hanging out together all the time. And they were, like, watching movies together with all the three of them every night instead of getting to know new people. And I was like, well, Percy never had friends when he was at school. Exactly. The only friends he made at school were, like, Rachel, Tyson, Grover. and Grover. <laughs> They're all people connected to, like you know, everything else. They weren't like actually people who wanted to be friends with him. And so like it does, you could maybe say that it was out of character for Annabeth, but the thing that the the person said in the, in that video that I thought was like, it made my head hurt (laughs) was that they were saying like, oh, maybe that's like a trauma thing because you know, that is something that people do when they're traumatized is they don't want to get to know new people. And there she's like, but this book isn't about trauma. So that can't be it. And I just like sat there and like literally like stared at my phone like this. And I was just like, traumatized people just exist in the world. (laughs) Like we, you don't, a book doesn't have to be about trauma, whatever that means. Like it doesn't have to be like a sad after school special in order to have traumatized people in it. Like every literally every single percy jackson book is about trauma because every person in it is traumatized like everyone everyone has ptsd in this in this world there's no way that they don't because because of what they experience yeah and it was so weird to hear somebody be like oh it can't be that they're traumatized because this book isn't about that and it's like every single book is about that like this entire book series is about that <laughs> and so rental trauma if if you want to get like just you know the very very basic outline it's all about how these kids have trauma from their god parents yeah and that, that that was just so i didn't i don't even know what that was just so weird that i was just like traumatized people just like exist in the world like you don't Somebody said that, like on that that video that I made talking about this. One comment I got was somebody being like, "Too many people have read fan fiction, and that's the only way." And by that, what they mean is that the only way that people understand what they think like PTSD is is by somebody who wrote the most overdramatic version of it in a fan fiction. And that is something that ha- I hate. That like me looking for fan fiction is like. of the stories that I end up starting to read, I immediately stop because I realize very quickly that the people who are writing it don't actually know what they're talking about. Yeah. They write about things in the most overdramatic kind of like overly bad way, like the most, the worst stuff you can possibly ever imagine. And they focused more on like the pain and stuff and like putting somebody through horrible stuff than like what they're actually doing or like, the like recovering or just how it actually happens. And so I think that's what that is, is somebody feeling like, like that you need some pronouncement in these books to be like, Percy is traumatized. And it's like, no fucking shit. (laughs) He's been traumatized. All of them have been their entire life. It sounds, and it would be like the weirdest experience on planet earth that like 19 years into like writing these books, for Rick Riordan to all of a sudden just have Percy be like, I'm traumatized. And it's like, we yeah. know. <laughs> like, like, like everything he does is like, you know, somewhat affected by that. The decisions he makes, the things that he does, the people he's friends with, how he reacts to things. That's been him since the very first book. And so it would be super weird. <laughs> and like all these books in for him to suddenly like, say that out of nowhere and it's like yeah we know dude like everyone else is too we don't it would just be so weird for him to say that now like oh i'm not making friends at school because i'm traumatized by everything that's happened to me and it's like yeah you didn't have friends when you were 12. Mm -hmm. like much less now when you're 18. (laughs) like we it was just so weird that i was like that made me feel like you almost need to like have permission to do things that you do because you're traumatized <laughs> or you need to like admit it first for people to realize that's where it's coming from or something. Well, I don't if, know. if you actually do admit it in real life, how many times do you get the reaction of ah, not everything's about your trauma? Stop being a victim. Like I like I don't really I don't talk about purely trauma stuff like that on TikTok anymore because 
every single time, every once in a while, there's like some story or something that is, and people are being so bad that I just do it, even though I know things that people are going to say, because it's hard to watch people do things that are, usually it's those stories that happen where people are like thinking that they're protecting some kid that's being abused by like making their life worse by going after their like abusive like parent or whatever and trying to get them fired on the internet and i'm like i don't want to watch a bunch of people on the internet think that they're being heroes when they're actively making this abused kid's life worse every single second of every single day and then they're going to forget about this kid in like a week and just move on and not care that they just ruined their life and made things much harder for them and so those sort of situations i try to like say something and every single time i do or any actually <laughs> even with like media stuff Every time I ever bring up the fact that I can't watch Game of Thrones because they have so much incest in it, that I can't watch it, and it's really aggravating that they make incest so integral to the plot, that, like, people are upset when it's, like, disgusting this season. They were, like, upset by how gross incest is. <laughs> and, that, and, like, there's been, like, three times where I've, like, made videos talking about how I wish that I could watch Game of Thrones because it looks, like, fun, but people, but incest is in in it so much that I can't watch it. And that's, you know, really frustrating because if you're gonna put that in the show, you should at least make it where like people who experience that can watch your show, mm -hmm. it being impossible to watch. And every time I would say that they're always like, you need to handle your own triggers. Your triggers are not our responsibility. And da 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 da. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a thing that we like, we've talked about before, but it's because like, I feel like people, this is a weird way to put it, but I feel like people too, in their heads, they sexualize incest so much that they're not seeing it as like a power imbalance thing or an abusive thing. They're, they're seeing it purely as a sexual thing, which like also is weird. Um, you know, like I find my brother repulsive in that kind of way, not as a person, but like, you know, I, I can yeah, yeah yeah like any man in my family it's never gonna be that it's 100 percent. i have this power and authority over you and i am going to exercise it how i see fit yeah, and it, it it always goes back to i don't know why i was talking about this the other day but there was some video or something where i was talking about this i don't know why anyway it was that people have the fundamental oh i know why it was that video i made about someone who is a creator that i really like on here but she it's weirdly fixated on like controlling the clothes that your kids wear and that if kids wear things that are like yeah deemed sexual or whatever like saying like a 12 year old kid shouldn't wear fishnets and it's like yes they should because they're just fishnets there's nothing wrong with that and so that video i was talking about people have this fundamental misunderstanding that they absolutely refuse to admit is wrong which is the big part of why kids get abused as much as they do they have this idea that like predators go after people because they're sexually attracted to them or they like are like romantically somehow a, a level of attraction is there because the only reason why you wouldn't want your kid to wear clothes that you think are too adult for them is because you think that it makes them more attractive to predators that's not what makes you attractive to predators what makes kids attractive to predators is if they don't have a good relationship with their parents they seem like they're people pleasing and they don't like seem to be asking them questions and stopping them from doing things that clearly make them uncomfortable. Predators can see when they're making a kid uncomfortable and the ones that don't fight it are the ones that they're going to go after. It doesn't matter what clothes they're wearing because there is no actual sexual attraction involved. The only thing that they want is domination and control and power. That's what they want. That's what, they're, that's what they want to have. Mm -hmm. Like my dad was not sexually attracted to me or like, he didn't look at me and think that I was like cute in that way. That's not like what was happening there. He wanted to use me to make himself feel better and didn't care what it did to me. Like it had nothing to do with me and like what I was wearing or the way that I looked or anything like that. And yeah. so people don't want to admit that. And so then when people do stories about incest that at all resemble like romance, which most of them have like some sort of romance in it, yeah. um it tends to be like that like ironically um i couldn't watch the first game of thrones because the first show because they actually did a really good job with 
um, Cersei and Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's absolutely like beyond funny that people don't realize what was really happening there because the victim of that situation was a man. Like Jamie was the victim of that and Cersei was the was the abuser. And so because the woman was the abuser of that incestor situation, somehow like it just like went over people's heads, like how bad what she was doing to him actually was. But like the books and the show version of at least what I heard shows that correctly that she's very abusive, she's very controlling, she's ruining his life and he keeps trying to get away from her and doesn't want actually to do any of this and just feels like he can't get away from her. And yeah. she just likes the idea that she has total control over this guy that everyone else is afraid of. It has nothing to do with like her actually liking him. Um, and so that's why people get that stuff wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's just, they don't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> like it's the most frustrating thing ever to hear people say stuff like that of like, oh, I, I think that it was right for my mom to tell me to like cover up when I went to a school dance when I was in seventh grade. And it was like, you're, I don't mean to sound mean, but your mom was like literally just wasting breath. Yeah. Because no predator is going to look at you and be like, oh, I like the dress you're wearing. So maybe you could say that about like older kids that might try to like groom, you know, younger girls or whatever. But it's never going to be like that for the people that they're actually talking about. Because most of the time when they're talking about that, they're talking about like adult predators, not people their kids' actual age. Mm -hmm. It's just very annoying. <laughs> it is, yeah. And like to go with our example of Luke being a predator, that's how he underestimated Percy, was just mm -hmm. he thought oh, you know, this is going to be like every other demigod that like has nobody, has never experienced real love and friendship. And I'm going to love bomb him with that a little bit and see where that gets me. But Percy has experienced real love. He has a good mom. And so that was kind of like a protective force uh, for him that like, I know what what good relationships are supposed to look like. Yeah, Percy has a good mom and also it's like the double thing that Percy has a mom that actually loves him and he also knows what it's like to like hide things from that person because he loves them and he and he doesn't want them to be like upset. Mm -hmm. So like in with that sort of a thing, like Percy's the last person that would be tricked by Luke in that way because he's the person that might try to hide how bad Luke actually is from everybody like he does in these books. But mm -hmm. it's but he knows that what Luke has done is like irredeemable. Because he's he saw like, you know, Gabe and every and all the other people that he knew like the teachers and kids at school and how they treated him. He knows what people do when they go too far. And mm -hmm. so he knew that. And so that combined with knowing what love is but also being used to hiding from people that you love like how bad somebody is hurting you because you feel like you should just be able to handle it yourself like he he would never join luke ever but he also would like try to protect everybody else from learning how bad luke actually was which is yeah. exactly what happened that's exactly how he would respond to that anyone like literally anyone else um would have at least like had I think that's maybe one of the reasons why people in the books like think that like Percy could possibly join Luke or they act like he's in danger with that somehow because mm -hmm. other kids might think about it more. But with his like unique experience like that growing up with his mom and with Gabe at the same time, he would he would never do that. And any any other kids like would think about it more like Annabeth does. Yes. Um, but not him. And it's one of those things that people don't understand that completely about him either. Mm -hmm. um, what else was I going to say? Oh, the last thing I was going to say was the book. Mm -hmm. um, one thing just to like bring up that I knew was happening when the last book came out too, is that ever since Leah was cast as Annabeth, um, he just doesn't like describe Annabeth's like physical like things like he never says the color like Tibbert describes her skin he never says like 
her hair color when he used to always say that she had blonde hair and like and blue eyes and stuff in the in the other books he just doesn't yeah. um, like comment on her physical characteristics anymore and i think that's like honestly it's a complicated thing but i do think it's the best way to kind of handle that yeah i feel like like acting like annabeth is or leah isn't annabeth now and just describing her the way that she was all the time before would feel really wrong. Mm -hmm. That he was, it would feel like he was like ignoring her in a way. And I, nobody would want, nobody would like that feeling. But at the same time, it's like, he's like, he's not gonna like magically make her black <laughs> after all of these years either, because that wouldn't be right either. Yeah, and so he's kind of splitting the difference by, we're just not gonna be too specific. Yeah, like I'm not gonna give her any physical characteristics i'm gonna give her characteristics like in the description of her when percy is like seeing her for the first time or in the book at least um he's like describing how she has like dutch braids in her hair that's something that white and black people can do and so it's kind of one of those things like no matter how you see her in your mind it fits with however you want her to look and like your mind's eye without having to like make a point out of it yeah is we all know that the racist people that are like clutching to the books for dear life at this point after the tv show would lose their minds if the books also described her like that and that's the last thing that anyone would ever want to happen at this point and so the best way to handle it is to do that and to like have her be described the way that percy would have described her in any other book he just describes what she's wearing and then says that she's like so beautiful that he forgot that she knows him <laughs> that he knows her and that she and is like amazed again that she's his girlfriend <laughs> um and i'm like yeah that's the exact perfect way to like introduce her again in every single book knowing that she's played by somebody who's black now is to not not really change how he would feel about her or how he would describe her in that way mm -hmm. just that's a difficult thing to like navigate, but I think that that's the best way for them to handle it. And it, it honestly makes me curious if they, if he describes in these newer books, like anyone else, because Percy doesn't have like black hair anymore um, compared to the show or like, you know, Grover is not like white. Um, it's Aryan. Like yeah, I think it's really <laughs> and, good and, like, for that head. I don't know. I don't think Clarice is in like the newer books, at least that I know of. She's not, but it's just like stuff like that. Like it makes me wonder um, because he does see like the newer cast as the as their characters now. Mm -hmm. And so it, it probably would just be easier at this point not to ever describe like their eye color or their hair color or anything like that. Everyone knows what they look like at this point anyway. <laughs> exactly. But it is funny, like, I remember um, Walker Scobell doing an interview where he said his some of his family were reading the books for the first time after he got the part. And they were all, like, greatly confused about the fact that Percy has, like, dark, like, black, almost colored hair and has, like, green eyes because they, they picture him. Mm -hmm. And they were like, that's not you. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Rick was thinking of the adaptations as much, at, like, when he was first writing them. And I'm sure, like... Even though the movies were a negative experience for him, I'm sure that they at least gave him the lens of this is this could be adopted again at some point. And maybe it's safer to not physically describe people so like detailed. Mm -hmm. You don't really have to. Yeah, it's not necessary as long as we know who they are and then we can transpose whatever features we want on them. <laughs> yeah, I don't think whatever he does these like three books that he's coming out with the last the next few like the last two years and next year mm -hmm. are he said that they're books that they were like like ideas for episodes for the show when they were like working for the many years where they were working on figuring out how they were going to adapt the show and so they're just kind of ideas from that stuff that they obviously ended up not using but and they he just like kind of made them into these books and so it's almost like a curious thing to imagine if he does end up writing books just another series one day with these characters like if mm -hmm. how differently he might write everybody yeah because <laughs> knowing that literally everyone <laughs> that he's ever had as a character could end up in a book in a tv show now 
<laughs> we left off at chapter 10, so we'll start with chapter 11 next week. And um, now that Percy's officially on the quest, um, that'll be interesting. I know eventually we get all the way to the West, so. The week after that, I saw that chapter 13 is we visit the graveyard of the gods, and I went, oh, no. <laughs> like, that's going to be really hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be good to, like, read, and there'll be lots to talk about, but, like, next week will be fine, but in two weeks, just be ready for that. Those are the Bianca chapters. Oh, gosh. Okay, yeah. Yeah. All right, so we'll see you guys next week. Okay. Take Bye. Care. Bye.